My name is Isabella Weber, and I'm thrilled to, Nancy, to, to welcome Nancy and all of you to the launch of Nancy's new book. Most of you will know Nancy Forber. Nancy Forber is Professor Emerita of the Economics Department here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Director of the Program on Gender and Care Work at the Political Economy Research Institute, which has kindly co-hosted this event today. Nancy is also a senior fellow of the Levy Institute um, at Bard College in the United States. In addition to numerous articles published in academic journals, Nancy is the editor of For Love and Money, Care Work in the US, and the author of Greed, Lust and Gender, A History of Economic Ideas, Valuing Children, Rethinking the Economics of the Family, and The Invisible Heart, Economics and Family Values. Today, we have the great pleasure to launch Nancy's latest book, which is The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, an Intersectional Political Economy, which has been just published by Verso. You can learn more about Nancy's work at her website and blog, which is called Care Talk. And let me just say, before I hand over to Nancy, that in the early days of the pandemic, many talked about the pandemic being like an X-ray that has brought to plain sight all intersectional inequalities, structures, and power relations in our societies. Nancy has been shedding light on these issues for decades. She, of course, didn't need this X-ray, but her work helps us to make sense of the images of these X-rays that are coming in day after day from around the globe. So her new book comes out just at the right time, just at the time when we need a framework to think through a new kind of intersectional political economy. Thank you everybody for joining and Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Isabella. And I'd also like to thank Shubhik Chakravorty and Lila Gautam for helping kind of orchestrate this. It's really exciting to have such a um, international group and I'm really looking forward to um, the discussion. Let me just share my screen here. In addition to um, thanking the um, people who were directly involved in setting things up, uh, I really wanna express my gratitude to uh, all my teachers, my colleagues, and my students at the University of Massachusetts, where I've been off and on for GASP, if you can believe it, um, since 1975. Um, and at one point in the, uh, at near the end of the 20th century, I actually devised a kind of, um, what's it called, um, coat of arms for the department. And it features a Latin saying that was apparently Karl Marx's favorite saying, de omnibus disputandum, argue about everything. So I hope you'll take that injunction um, to heart and I'm looking forward to a really good discussion. So um, the title of my book is pretty ambitious, The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems. Um, notice that it's not rise and fall, uh, and we are, of course, we are not the Roman Empire, although the Roman Empire will show up, um, will pop up in my story. Um, here you have on the right hand side of the screen, uh, a kind of rendition of the bull of Wall Street, a kind of modern minotaur, a hybrid beast hanging out in the labyrinth and he too is gonna uh, show up uh, later in the story. So I know Twitter has some uh, downsides, but uh, I often find it helpful as a way of really condensing and distilling my thoughts. And, uh, and at some earlier point um, in the month, I, I tweeted out kind of a plan for my presentation. And I'm gonna stick to this plan. I wanna center care. I wanna rethink some keywords of political economy. Uh, and I want to lead up to uh, kind of a comment, an interpretation of the current political moment uh, within the context of the uh, 
rise and decline of patriarchal systems that I think could also, should also, must also be described as racist, capitalist, nationalist systems. So as Isabella was indicating, we are really now in a kind of care uh, moment, a care movement, and it, it's very much um, part of a popular political discourse that's emerged because of the pandemic that has really clarified our interdependence and also our great dependence on unpaid work. And I think it also raises some important parallels between our social climate and our physical climate, uh, parallels that have to do with interdependence, um, parallels that have to do with uh, solidarity and the effects of solidarity or social capital on our resilience and our ability to cope with um, catastrophic and uh, other changes. I think another reason why the care moment is, is suddenly looming very large is that it offers a really positive vision of what we want and need. Um, that is, in simple terms, more and better care. I have to say this, this sentence, every man for himself is a recipe for extinction, is possibly my favorite sentence in the whole book because it uses the word recipe. And um, it also links environmental issues with care issues, which I think is really key. This is the symbol, this hourglass in the, um, in the circle is the symbol of the Extinction Rebellion, which is a really uh, interesting international movement um, trying to uh, address uh, climate change. So one indicator of the uh, way in which the care issue has infused political discussion is its um, increasing visibility in what I would call the socialist imaginary. I think it's it's now becoming um, a very, very important word uh, within that community. And one indication of that is these two books that Verso recently published. Um, pretty much contemporaneously with my own book. One is The Care Manifesto by The Care Collective and the other, The Care Crisis by Emma Dowling. And I think they're, they're both really good books that highlight the role of um, neoliberal capitalism and um, austerity politics in the care crisis. And they're also very attentive to inequalities based on race and gender uh, and nationality. But uh, they both really tell a very traditional story, class-based story in which capitalism plays the center role. And I think it's, um, uh, that story is over simple. And I, what I wanna do is take that story and make it a little bit uh, more complicated. That, that's kind of my, my main goal. One place to start with the complications is to note that care isn't just a lovey-dovey, um, wonderful thing. It also has a downside. Um, care is, is really important to cooperation, but cooperation sometimes leads to collaboration, which leads to conspiracy, um, to collusion. Uh, we often see really high levels of care and commitment to in-groups, but not to out-groups, people that uh, we define somehow as outside the boundaries uh, of, our own, uh, of our own group. And it's also really important to note that inadequate care provision and exploitation of care providers didn't begin with neoliberal capitalism. In fact, it didn't even begin with plain old capitalism or plain old feudalism. Um, it has a really, really, really long history. Uh, and it's a history that um, uh, reveals uh, direct coercion, force and violence, and also indirect or institutional control. And I think the use of force and violence and the way in which the results of force and violence can be institutionalized in ways that lead to exploitative outcomes is common to patriarchal, racist, and nationalist power as well as class power. I think it, to, in order to understand this, we really need to take um, what is sometimes called the inter intersectional turn um, and what I want to do here is just emphasize the complexity of inequality, that 
the intersectional perspectives developed by thinkers like Angela Davis, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, Patricia Hill Collins, among others, um, observe that people belong to many different groups simultaneously. And I, I take that to mean that most of us are winners in some respects and losers in other respects. So we're operating in a really confusing political environment that makes it really hard to form coalitions for progressive, um, progressive political change. So just looking at this picture, you can see like, which way do we go? Where do we, how do we get off the highway of doom? It's not, it's not a, an easy question to answer. But the, um, the tack I wanna take in answering it is to uh, kind of take a deep dive into some <clears throat> rather abstract theory, um, which I think actually has a pretty significant impact on the way that we interpret um, historical change. And I wanna challenge um, three binaries that I think are, are really built in um, to the way that most of us view the world. A, uh, a binary between economic interests and social identities, a binary between class versus non-class divisions, and a, a binary between exploitation and oppression. And when I say challenge the binary, I don't mean to say that there's no distinction at all between these concepts, but rather, I don't think it's helpful um, to look at them as though they're just two categories opposed to one another. And in particular, I think the term non-class divisions is not very useful because it lumps everything else other than class into one category as though that's a sort of parallel. You know, to me, to talk about non-class divisions is like talking about a group of people as non-whites or even to talk about women as non-men. It shouldn't be defined by what it is not because there's a lot of diversity and complexity within that category. And I think that um, in some ways, as the little picture there of do the dollar sign versus the heart indicates, there's also a little tension between love and money, um, things that we shouldn't think of as complete opposites because they sometimes overlap and intersect in some complicated ways. And just reconsidering these, um, I think helps us redefine or broaden the concept of what we mean by the economic or the economy. So I wanna look at four key terms here. Um, production, mode of production, social reproduction, and exploitation. And just take each of them in their turn um, pretty briefly, because the first five chapters of my book are really efforts to reconfigure uh, the theoretical vocabulary. And this is kind of a compressed version of that presentation. So in classical political economy, um, Production is the production of goods and services for consumption or exchange, but not labor itself. Labor itself is not a produced uh, good. It's kind of a gift of nature or more specifically a gift of, of motherhood. Um, and that's reflected in current national income accounting um, methods, definitions, uh, protocols, where gross domestic product is defined quite narrowly as the value of all goods and services that are purchased through the market. And I think it's, it's really crucial to expand the concept of production to include the production, the development and the maintenance of human capabilities. In some ways, I think care is a shorthand uh, for that. There are a lot of different nomenclatures that we could, we could use for that. Um, but um, I think that emphasis on, on producing not just labor, but human capabilities in general is really, really uh, crucial to my framework. So, in, in, traditional, um, in traditional Marxism, um, the concept of mode of production is based on the extraction of surplus in production, the way in which surplus is extracted. And they're pretty stylized sequences, primitive communism, feudalism, capitalism, there are variants of those, there are you know, a variety of adjectives that might be appended to them, but it's, it's all kind of, a, a stage system. And I, I'd like to replace that uh, approach or that image with a picture of systems intersecting, kind of overlapping recombinant structures of collective power. And to view capitalist, racist, nationalist, patriarchal institutional structures um, as sometimes reinforcing and sometimes conflicting with one another.
Okay, my PowerPoint has just stalled. There we go. Here is a, you know, I've been struggling for a really long time to find a good visual image for um, what I mean by um, these kind of overlapping uh, structures. Uh, and I'm not really happy with any of them yet, but I like this sort of jagged asymmetrical but vaguely fractal uh, image here. And, uh, you know, some scholars try to acknowledge this complexity by using adjectives like patriarchal capitalism or racial capitalism. But I think it's, it's interesting to note that capitalism is always the noun and the other dimensions are always the adjective. And I think it's partly because we're in the habit of thinking of capitalism as the economic system but racism, sexism, and nationalism uh, also have economic dimensions. They're very much a part of, of the way in which uh, resources are, are out produced and allocated. So a term that's really come into prominence in, in Marxist feminism is social reproduction. And I think it's a tremendous advance and I'm very excited by work that's taking place within that social, social reproduction uh, paradigm um, because it's, acknowledging the importance of unpaid work and the fact that labor itself is a produced, it is produced uh, and in fact is really crucial. But um, I think one limitation of the social reproduction literature is it's so focused on the social reproduction of capitalism. And it's not just capitalism, every system that's ever existed has depended heavily on care work, on unpaid work. And also, uh, social reproduction is not always a sort of benign process of provisioning and meeting people's needs. It's often a process that involves violent enforcement of group definitions of group boundaries, as in the social reproduction of, um, of whiteness or of masculinity. So here's, I really love this image from the Red Women's, from the Sea Red Women's Workshop in, in, um, in England. And I used it on the cover of an earlier book, um, who pays for the kids. Um, and it, it sort of captures the essence of social reproduction. That is that the labor that's going into the factory is being uh, maintained and, and cared for on a daily basis uh, by women in this extra site of economic, of economic activity, the home. But I think this image also betrays the limitations of the, of the uh, social reproduction frame because we're only seeing the daily maintenance of workers, we're, we're not seeing any children, we're not seeing any elderly persons here. Uh, all the workers are white. There's no real differentiation uh, among the workers. There's no indication of any other uh, kind of dimension of, of uh, social conflict. So it's, it's very much focused on the reproduction of the wage earner on a, on a daily basis. So exploitation in the traditional Marxian lexicon, it's defined as the expropriation of surplus or surplus value in production. Um, I make a case for a more general definition that I think encompasses that traditional Marxist definition, taking unfair advantage of another person or group. Um, unfair advantage is a something that uh, like uh, as a form of as a contributor to exploitation has to be collectively and democratically defined and eliminated, blocked or reduced uh, to the fullest extent possible. And I don't think it's as vague or as general as it sounds. I think that it's what we do when we make and enforce laws. And I think economic theory has some really useful tools, um, especially uh, bargaining models to help us think about how to define uh, unfair advantage. So, I try to show the relevance of these theoretical moves by applying them to some of the sort of classic transitions or episodes of the uh, uh, traditional political economy lexicon, the origins of patriarchal and feudal structures, tensions and synergies with capitalist institutions, the way in which national and class and race interests converge in colonialism, the emergence of welfare states, changes in the shapes of it, gender inequality. I'm just gonna give a sort of um, very abbreviated account uh, of the, um, some historical, some of the historical content uh, of my argument. I think that um, 
I can build on the work of Gerda Lerner, Maria Mies, and others to argue that patriarchal societies ne didn't necessarily emerge at the very beginning of human society. I think we probably saw more egalitarian, many more egalitarian forms of social organization. But it seems likely that patriarchal societies expanded at the expense of others, partly as a result of control over women's reproductive capabilities. And further inequalities were in many cases built upon those inequalities of gender and, and age. So race, nation, class become definitions of group membership that are used to amplify the concentration of military and economic power. And the overlapping hierarchies that, that evolve really make it possible to consolidate power at the top because they take advantage of divisions at the bottom and facilitate uh, co-optation co of, of resistance or opposition uh, to them. I thought I said I'd, I'd promised a little riff on the, the Roman Empire here. And this is an inset from a, a, a famous painting by the French painter David of the rape of the Sabine women. It's a scene that's been painted, you know, many, many times um, um, uh, because it's such a central part of Roman history. And it, it's basically a story about a bunch of men who decide to found a new city, a city called Rome, but can't f do so without finding wives. And because they're having a hard time finding wives, they decide to trick their neighbors, the Sabines, into bringing their daughters to a great festival, a great party. When they arrive, uh, the Roman men seize the women and drive the men away. They then marry the women, basically rape the women, uh, but marry them, get them pregnant. And by the time the Sabines have rallied their forces and brought their allies together to come and reclaim their daughters, most of the daughters have given birth and are terrified at the prospect of a war in which both their fathers and their brothers and the fathers of their own children and possibly their children themselves will, will be harmed. So they stand up and, and basically stop the fight. So to me, it's a really good, um, it's a wonderfully dramatic illustration of the ways in which um, women are held vulnerable as a result of their commitment uh, to children and the responsibilities of, of care uh, for dependents. Um, I know it's a very Eurocentric um, tale, but I think it's basically a foreshadowing of what, the way in which Europe in effect later conquered the world uh, using force and violence uh, very much to its collective economic advantage um, and often with very uh, gendered uh, consequences. So it, that's why I think it really bears thinking about. So here we have patriarchal institutions that we've seen over the last 100 years, 200 years or so decline in some very significant ways, certainly in terms of family law and property rights. And uh, the, the way most economists explain this is simply as a result of technological change that made uh, physical differences between men and women less important. And surely technological change is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Um, I think there were many other reasons, many other factors contributing to this very gradual, heavily contested process of, of renegotiation of, of these institutions. In the first place, racial, national, class inequalities put some women into privileged positions. That was kind of one of the costs of the, one of the risks that emerged from more complex hierarchical systems. Capitalist development undermined families as units of production and reproduction, and it pulled women into independent employment. Fertility decline, partly a result of changes in, in the economics of families, decreased women's specialization in reproductive work and increased their bargaining power. And women were sometimes able to overcome their differences and organize collectively for their rights. And that collective contestation was really key. But, um, while many patriarchal institutions have 
kind of lost some of their force, they remain somewhat persistent. And we need to explain this persistence as well. And here are some of the factors that I think contribute to it. Privileged groups based on race, class, and citizenship tend to favor existing hierarchies. There's always the concern that destabilizing one will destabilize another, which as I've argued, it sometimes happens. And so uh, that creates kind of uh, alliances among those in advantaged privileged positions to um, uh, uh, resist uh, changes, even th those that might benefit some aspect of their own um, uh, group identity. Occupational segregation and welfare state policies tend to reinforce women's specialization and care provision, which is really economically important, but um, somewhat disempowering. A decline in the quantity of children is countervailed by increasing demand for child quote unquote quality. Um, uh, the amount of time and effort that has to be uh, devoted to the um, development of children's capabilities, and also growing elder care responsibilities come into play. And finally, I think uh, with changes in family law, both employers and men gained increased opportunities to free ride on women's reproductive labor uh, that played a role. So uh, if we look around today, we see a lot of systemic tensions uh, that are related to many different dimensions of inequality. And I think the contestation and delegitimation of many forms of discrimination has had a kind of a interesting delegitimating effect on the way in which people think about inequality in general, and also in the way in which they visualize a good society, uh, a caring society. Uh, the degradation of our social environment as well as our physical environment is increasingly apparent. Climate change is one aspect of that changes in the social climate uh, from op opioid addiction to uh, intensified poverty um, and inequality on the, the global level. Um, uh, the forced migration, the uh, refugee problems, these are all, I think, uh, becoming really, really, really salient global issues. At the same time, there's reduced consonance between corporate interests and national interests. Um, corporate tax evasion through profit shifting, that's one example. The rise of Trumpism is another. I think uh, nationalism and capitalism um, are still closely allied, but there, uh, there are some tensions between them that are really reflected in the um, evolution, especially recently, of the Republican Party. Um, we've also seen slow wage growth uh, in, in the developing world, uh, uh, slow growth in wage employment and a, a burgeoning informal sector. Uh, at the same time, increased global concentration of wealth. Um, and there's some really great estimates by Oxfam of the share of, the, of global wealth owned by the 1%. It's a truly uh, shocking number. And I think it's absolutely uh, accurate uh, to point out that most of us are part of a 99% of the global population that is in a very, very different position vis-a-vis -vis access to wealth and capital uh, than the 1%. However, it's also true that there are very big div divisions among the 99%. And if those divisions could be overcome, there would be a lot greater potential to challenge the unequal distribution of wealth. So, so let me just take a breath and give you a little reprise of what the kind of recombinant theory I'm trying to develop consists of, what it, what it, where it comes from. I, I've taken three really important kind of ideas uh, concepts for Marxian political economy, an emphasis on collective identity and conflict, an emphasis on historical materialism, looking at how social systems evolve and how um, the process of producing the goods that we need uh, to survive and also producing our own capabilities uh, creates 
uh, processes that uh, lead to major changes in social institutions. And then finally, the, the, the idea that a lot of the trends that we experience are kind of contradictory, just as Marx argued that capitalism had a, a place in world history as a process of developing the forces of production, um, but also created uh, uh, problems that were likely to lead to increasing crisis. I think we, we see in, on a larger scale, uh, a lot of uh, uh, contradictory and complex processes that we're still struggling to understand. I think there's, there are also some tools from um, neoclassical institutional theory that we can bring in, that I bring into the story and I think belong in the story. I think game theory is a very, provides some very good tools for challenging that every man for himself leads to optimal outcomes story. Um, uh, it, I think it really emphasizes the need for cooperation and the tremendous gains that we can um, enjoy as a result of effective cooperation. Cooperative bargaining models are ways to try to think about how people make binding agreements, why they might break those binding agreements, what those binding agreements uh, achieve for them in terms of, of their ability to um, solve problems more efficiently, but also sometimes to, to gang up on other groups. And finally, I think the, the emphasis on in, in kind of traditional welfare theory on free riding on public goods um, is really relevant to thinking about the climate crisis, but also thinking about uh, the free riding on women's uh, reproductive commitments. That's very central to the, uh, the care crisis. I also take, uh, some really important points from feminist political economy, critical race theory, stratification economics. And I would summarize those as follows. Specialization and care provision reduces bargaining power. Women do not all share the same interests, neither do men, neither do workers. Equality requires expanded rights, shared obligations and collective commitments to the development uh, of human capabilities. And I guess I'm going to give the uh, I give, I'm going to give the Sea Red Women's Workshop the last word here. I think that um, that this is a, a poster that really speaks to the current political moment, um, and I I think I just want to add that racism is not the only thing that divides us. Uh, national differences, uh, which, which are not exactly the same, and international inequalities also threaten to divide us in a really uh, profound way. And the better that uh, we understand our divisions, I think the better able we will be to overcome them. So I really think that political economy can play uh, a really important role in helping us um, change the world. Thanks very much. I'm really looking forward to your comments, your criticisms, your arguments. Uh, and here's the um, URL for my website and blog. I'll try to respond to some comments, questions that I can't get to today there. Um, it's, it's kind of a nice venue for informal uh, exchange. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much, Nancy. This was a wonderful talk. We have a chance for everybody to ask questions in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box. Um, and Leila Gautum, who is kindly helping us uh, here in the background, will help um, moderate the questions in the Q&A. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so please, have your questions coming um, in the Q&A and uh, we will make sure to address them to Nancy. Okay, the first question is from Shailaja Fennell. Um, Shailaja, you should be able to turn on your audio. Would you like to ask your question?
Okay, we cannot hear Shailacha, so let me ask the question on your behalf. I really like the proposal to develop a recombinant theory, and this is a very powerful method to, um, of reclaiming economic analysis in the realm of international development as well. Is there a protocol that we can develop for this purpose? Um, I think if there is a protocol, I think this is it. Talking, thinking, arguing uh, about it um, in, in, in an international community, I think is uh, the way that we need to move forward. Um, other than that, it's hard for me to say exactly what the protocol, I, I guess I would say I don't really have a clear um, list of next steps. And I see that as something that really needs to be um, at a collaborative discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, let us move on to the next question by Isabel Pastor. Um, Isabel, can, can you unmute yourself and talk to us? No, okay, then let me just ask on your behalf. Thank you for your excellent talk. Do you think it's inevitable that one household member will specialize in care work? Is there a truly efficient way for households to be organized that doesn't place the burden of care on women and doesn't leave a household member with little bargaining power? Yes, uh, I think that's a great question. And I, I, um, I think the, the traditional kind of economic argument as outlined by Gary Becker is that specialization is efficient, uh, which leads people to fear that um, somehow sharing tasks equally uh, is inefficient and uh, would be really economically costly. But I think there's actually a pretty good uh, and growing literature challenging that view. And it, it basically um, emphasizes I think this is funny because it, or at least um, heartening and ironic, uh, it sort of uses the economic concept of, of uh, portfolio diversification. That is, if you have two people who are sharing tasks, you have more flexibility, you have more, um, uh, you have more potential to respond to problems if one person loses their job and another, another partner has it. If one parent gets sick, the other parent can, can be an effective substitute. So I think we'll always see maybe some, some degree of specialization in the way that people organize unpaid work and care of dependents. But the less, you know, the more diversification that we have and the more we move towards more um, sharing of those responsibilities, I think the better off we'll be. Isabella, I have Thank you. Yes. Who was that? Okay, someone just spoke to me whom I don't know who it was. Sorry, Shailaja, that, was Shailaja. It? Yes, it's me, Isabella. Sorry. I somebody un mute unmuted me so I can't speak now. May I uh <laughs> Please sorry. follow up on your question. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to ask Nancy. Sorry, it's hard to type this. Uh, it's just yeah. formulating the thought. So the question for protocol is because I thought it was really powerful. The notion of collectivity and care, which is on your left hand side of your slide on recombinant. I thought that was very helpful in terms of addressing precisely this point about Becker, about portfolio, which is the only way of combining is one person trade off against another. There isn't the possibility of additivity, it's always trade-offs, always subtraction. So that was the very fascinating point that I wanted to, to address. And I think there's a, a very powerful way of doing this going forward. So I just wanted to make that point. Sorry, Isabella, I couldn't type that properly to make it clear. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for you. joining the discussion, Shailata. Yeah, you made that, I think you put that very well. Okay, did you want to follow up on that, Nancy? Just to say, I agree. Okay. Okay, then we have Ramel M. Ramel, would you like to pose your question? You should be able to speak. Yes. Unmute. 
Um, hello, I think you, uh, I hope you can hear me. My question was about um, ways of accounting for education and human capability development as Professor Nancy uh, proposed in her uh, presentation, which is a very uh, attractive idea, but it is implementation. Uh, I think I have never heard any concrete ways for doing that. So it would be interesting to hear professors approach about that. Thank you for a very, very interesting uh, speech and uh, seminar. I think we can conceptualize a care sector of the economy that consists of um, the uh, three three industry three kind of standard industries in the uh, kind of economic lexicon: health, education, social welfare. But we also have to add in unpaid work. A lot of unpaid work um, is directly devoted to the production and development of human capabilities, and. Uh, I have argued for a long time that instead of making this uh, strict division between unpaid work and paid work or market work and non-market work, we should instead make a distinction between care work, whether paid or unpaid and other forms of work. Because I think when ca even care work, even when it is paid has some very distinctive uh, characteristics. The labor process is different and the, the quote unquote output of, of uh, care work is different. It's much more difficult to measure. It's more difficult to monetize, and it's it's more difficult to 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 capture. And I think um, people who are in the who are in occupations in health and education and welfare uh, often experience lower pay as a result of the distinctive uh, characteristics of of that labor process. So how you asked how we would measure it. Well, I think we what we wanna do is impute a value to um, at least the inputs, the value of the inputs that are going into uh, the production and maintenance uh, of human capabilities. And then also think about a kind of dashboard of indicators that we would think about in terms of outputs, you know, indicators consistent with the Human Development Index and other indices that have been used in, by development economists to try to look at um, outcomes like life expectancy, uh, educational uh, achievement, um, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of jobs for accountants, I think, in this task. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question from Anne Ferguson. Anne Ferguson, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, so Nancy, wonderful talk um, as usual. I love your graphics particularly. <laughs> um, and I just want if you know uh, this question, um, can you explain whether or not you think patriarchy is still a mode of production of people that's importantly based in the family or, or patriarchal relations anyway, um, in the family household and the gender division of labor there between care and labor, uh, primarily done by women and so forth. Um, and if not, what do you think are the important institutions that are key in advanced capitalist patriarchy today uh, of, of yeah. all sorts? Yeah, really, really good question. Uh, Actually, I try not to use the noun patriarchy and I try not to use the noun capitalism because I think uh, I wanna emphasize a system that is um, a very complex hybrid of a lot of different structures of collective power. Um, but in some ways, my analysis sort of comes around to the same, uh, to a very, very similar points. That is asking what are the social institutions in place that uh, limit or reduce the bargaining power of women relative to men in households. Uh, and also I would extend that uh, affect the bargaining power of young people and affect the people, affect the bargaining power of people with um, non-conforming uh, sexual identities. And the institutional uh, obstacles I think today are very, very different than they were in the past. I think that that in the past we saw a lot of explicit family law that that uh, made it very very difficult for um, women 
uh, to enter families and have an effective voice uh, within them. And that's really not true today. But I think um, women, women continue to specialize in care work, both unpaid care work and paid care work. And that specialization uh, is very risky and uh, very disempowering. And I think until we change that division of labor, uh, we're not gonna make much additional progress in uh, reducing uh, uh, gender inequality. Um, also, I think there's some really powerful cultural norms that um, are very deeply embedded in our history and take a long time to re renegotiate. And there's this really kind of um, painful asymmetry in the renegotiation of norms. It's a lot easier, uh, I think, uh, to demand new rights and gain new rights than it is to impose new obligations. And so that's put women in a difficult bargaining uh, kind of position where, uh, uh, you know, the essence of bargaining power is withdrawing your services, threatening to leave. But if you, th if you threaten to withdraw your services or leave and the cost to those that you care for um, is really high, you, you're, you're basically a prisoner of your own altruistic commitment. Um, and so that the kind of cultural norms that we, you know, that shape our, the, the intensity of, of, of commitments uh, to dependence is something that um, puts women, uh, women in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very difficult bargaining position. Thank you very much. The next question that I have here is from Madia Nadim. Madia, would you like to pose your question? Hi, hello. Can, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great talk. Um, so my question is regarding um, because in you know in a debate in feminism and in capitalism we always say that uh, you know the poverty has feminine face and things like that. So I was just thinking about uh, your idea of patriarchy. Do you think that patriarchy is a, is a concept that has gender? Because, you know, in some culture, especially in the context of South Asia, because I'm from basically from Pakistan, there are some culture in family where women also become the part of, you know, uh, they become the agent to support or to defend patriarchy in order to, you know, retain their own power in the, in, in the they become the agent of, you know, power. So when, whenever they find themselves in relative better powerful positions, they try to protect that that uh, patriarchy. So, so what do you think? Do you think it's a it's a kind of causing uh, problem problems for women, uh, you know, movement which is going on everywhere in the world. So, I was just thinking about what are your views about that? Yeah, I think that's you raise a really important issue. For me. Uh, that's a very good illustration of why why patriarchal institutions proved really persistent, because they put women in a position where um, really uh, their ability to improve their situation without exploiting other women was really limited. So, you know, reliance on a younger generation for support in old age gives women a really strong economic incentive to to control the younger generation and to um, uh, basically drive some compensation for gender inequality from the kind of uh, other dimensions, other aspects of, of patriarchal power. And uh, the way in which that, that, that uh, arrangement gets destabilized or or not, you know, sometimes restabilized, I think depends very much on contingent cultural um, circumstances and national, uh, national regimes. I don't think we can make a, 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 a simple generalization about how it proceeds, but I think what we can do is observe it, what you've described as an example of the complexity of collective conflict and the reason why it's often really hard 
to uh, persuade people to challenge existing social institutions is that they almost always have some stake, some, some possible stake in existing hierarchies that makes them uh, very reluctant uh, to, um, to challenge them. And yet sometimes they do. So um, it's a, you know, it's a complicated dialectic. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you for a great question. Um, we have Vina Sidat next. Vina, would you like to pose your question? Yes, thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Nancy, for a very, very interesting discussion. And I like the graphics as well. I've been thinking a lot about, especially during COVID, how persistent it is for the division of labor uh, within the household to stay to men's share of health care work to stay the same. And that's happened during COVID despite the greater care demands at home. It's happened in industrialized countries, poorer countries. What measures do you think could change this to have men take on more care work at home? And how could um, we change the public's view of this? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with your assessment of the empirical trends. I think. The evidence is kind of mixed um, and hasn't, we don't really yet have very accurate measures uh, of, of how the division of labor has been altered by the pandemic. But I think in a lot of cases, we've seen men doing more, uh, but not doing nearly as much more as women. Uh, but we've also seen them being more exposed to the actual process of taking care of of children and other family members at home in a, in a way that I think might be actually um, uh, culturally uh, somewhat catalytic. I guess uh, the extent to which that's true remains to be seen. But I also think we've seen, uh, at least in some parts of the world, uh, or in, in, in some parts of the labor force, uh, a uh, growing ability to combine work uh, at home with work for pay that could also have a positive impact. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's it, I think it's pretty hard at this point to to know to to tell what the long run versus short run effects of the pandemic. Are going to be. I think one one research finding that I'm really struck by that I find really interesting is that communities where there's kind of a higher level of solidarity and uh, less inequality have been better at, at coping, uh, less vulnerable to infection than communities that were more divided and and kind of less cooperative. And I guess I'd like to think that there might be a lesson there about the benefits of cooperation, even though. Um, we haven't seen as much kind of cooperation as we would like. Um, and I also think economically, the, the pandemic has really demonstrated the, these pretty catastrophic effects on women's ability to participate in wage employment related to schools and, and childcare um, shutting down. And um, I think in a lot of people's minds, it's established a stronger connection between investment in those public policies and uh, the um, whole possibility for women to earn uh, earn independent income. Um, so, you know, in a way, you're asking me a question of, about. Um, that goes against my central point, you know, which is that the what we're seeing are a lot of sort of complicated and conflicting trends, and I, I don't think there's like one one strategy or one formula to reduce the gender division of labor, um, other than pressing on both fronts, more public services and also more uh, support for paid leave time and ability to combine paid work and family work. Um, and 
I think that's one of the reasons that we see activists in this area pursuing a range of different strategies and tr just letting a hundred flowers bloom, just letting, trying to uh, just try everything to look for some kind of chink in the system, you know, pressing for paid family leave, for sick leave, uh, for better childcare, for better educational investments and showing, trying to show how this is really linked to, to a, a process of, of improving overall uh, economic capabilities. I always feel bad when I don't have a magic bullet. <laughs> um, you had a great answer. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we have uh, Paula Herrera Ida Idaraga next. Paula, would you mind to unmute yourself and pose your question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. You sound good. Uh, that's great. So I have uh, a few questions, one regarding the, the, the actual crisis that we're living in. So we know that the crisis have pushed some women out of the labor force. And as you were saying, some of them are doing most of the, of the care work. Yep. So men are helping a little bit. So as care was moving into being provided by the market into paid care, and uh, we know that because of the statistics, some of the women were able to get to, to work because they were able to get this paid care work in the market. And we know that government in certain countries, as for sure in Colombia, they have neglected care for, for all our history. I was wondering, how do you think this, this crisis will reconfigure, if any, the provision of care? That's my, one of my first questions. And the other one regarding one of the, of, of the points that you were making before, that some of the women are man have managed to get out of the oppression of patriarchy by also oppressing some women, as for instance, in Colombia, yeah. if you have some women that are able to get out of the, to go to work, they hire a domestic worker with a very low wage. And in some cases, these uh, domestic workers are also in a situation of exploitation. So I was wondering how much of the inequality can be explained also by this oppression of women, between women as well, which are trying to get out of these patriarchy systems. That's my, my, my two questions, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, I guess I'm trying, I guess I'm trying to argue that on the one hand, uh, we need to recognize and understand the divisions that you describe. Uh, but that on the other hand, uh, we, we need to establish political alliances or coalitions uh, that speak to them in a pretty clear way. And I, I think to me what that means is that, you know, rather than saying, here's, here's a policy that will reduce gender inequality in the household, or here's a policy that will reduce poverty, or here's a policy that will reduce um, uh, racial discrimination, uh, we need to have a, a consistent set of policies that, sa that says, look, we want an economy that provides care uh, efficiently and equitably to everybody. And in order to do that, we need the following. And we need to be addressing all of those dimensions of inequality together. Maybe not all in exactly the same way, or all in you know at the same you know at the same level of intensity. But we need we need to have a portfolio of ideas based on a vision of a caring society. We can't. I don't think we're going to uh, progress if we are just you know singling out one group um, uh, as you know the the the, the historical agent. Um, that, that needs to be prioritized. I mean, just, it's like that argument between, it's like the, the, the sort of the dilemma of socialist feminism, you know, like uh, who, do you, who do you support, workers or women? Well, you, obviously to me, you gotta support both um, and you have to support them together and you have to develop kind of a unified theory of why everybody in the long run is gonna gain by moving towards a more um, more just division of labor. Thank you, Nancy. That's what I <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have a question from Joya Misra. Joya, can you hear us and can you unmute yourself? 
Hi, Nancy. Can you hear me? I can. This is such a wonderful talk. And you've already, just in response to the last question, sort of started addressing this. But one of the things I've been really taken with, and I haven't, you know, I don't want to inappropriately bring us back to the US. But I've been really sort of focused around uh, both some sort of exciting news about early childhood education in the state of Massachusetts. And when I look at Biden's um, plans, there's a lot of there's a lot of policy priorities that I agree with. And I'm just sort of wondering if you can use this kind of beautiful theoretical model that you've brought us to make recommendations or I mean, I, I feel like you've just sort of given us a let every flower bloom. <laughs> um, but if you have other thoughts, I'm happy to, I'm, I'd love to hear them. I'm very encouraged by what is happening with the Biden administration. And I think it reflects the kind of historical dynamics uh, that I've, I've referred to. I, I, you know, and I think the, you know, testimony that comes from the fact that, that uh, I think, Biden's policy proposals took a lot of people in the Democratic Party by surprise. Um, and I think they are very much a, a, a reaction to kind of the, 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 the crisis of care, as it were. Um, I, actually, I don't have very a very, um, I don't have a particular priority or concern about the Biden uh, proposal because it's so uncertain right now uh, what kinds of political support can be mobilized uh, for this vision. So um, we're in a difficult period of transition. You know, progressive activists have not had much voice on the national level. People have been working on the local level. Clearly, there's a lot of um, examples of successes on the local level, like child, the, the expansion of childcare and childcare funding in some states or paid family leave in some states. So we, we have a lot of kind of state level innovations that we can draw from in trying to develop, trying to push for the, the national agenda. But I guess my main, my main message here, simplistic though it may be, is that we need to be unified we need to really uh, get behind uh, whatever proposals we think can can move us forward and get us in the right, get us going in the right political direction. And by the way, I'd be very interested in opinion in your opinion of which of what those might be. Thank you. Um, now we have a next question from Yanis Berry. Yanis Barry, can you hear us? Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, hello, Nancy. Uh, wonderful as always. Uh, uh, so uh, well-tempered and so thoughtful. Uh, much of what I was really thinking about has uh, been addressed in some prior questions, including um, uh, the last one where uh, I, I do feel that uh, there has been uh, major momentum in many ways uh, due to your pioneering work over the many decades. Uh, but uh, having people like uh, Heather Boucher and others who are uh, uh, you know, following uh, uh, your work and uh, the, the care work and pushing that agenda forward, I was just thinking, uh, and there could be uh, people on this, uh, uh, you know, this lecture that could speak to this uh, better than I, although I, I did live in Finland for some time and taught there. Um, and my, my question was, in the Nordic countries, there is less specialization in the care work provided by men and women for their children and parents. Uh, both genders are, are pretty good at it. Uh, much of the work is directly paid for by employers in the state. One thing we know from this literature is this enables women's labor force participation to increase, increase and stabilize. I'm not sure that uh, maybe that's what we want, but that is what has happened. 
Uh, wouldn't this suggest that a collective approach to providing and paying for care work is an essential basic first step? That is to say the care work, as you have suggested in uh, who's minding the kids, should be framed as a public good. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I, I pretty much completely agree with everything that you just said. Um, I, maybe I would add one thing that um, making a case for public provision of care services as a public good is really key. But I think it's also true that uh, we're living in a very competitive capitalist economy in which people who want to work less than 40 hours a week or even less than 50 hours a week um, pay kind of a big economic penalty for it. And I think another issue that we need to address um, here in the US in particular is um, removing some of the penalties on part-time work so that uh, men as well as uh, women might be more, have more flexibility uh, to combine uh, family work and, and market work. Um, so I, I also think that there's a, a, a political balance that we want to strike between kind of the public encouraging more public services and encouraging more changes in in uh, in households uh, and both with, with respect to the gender division of labor and with the amount of time and flexibility that we have to uh, provide care uh, for family and friends and, and neighbors. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Susan Bradley. Susan, can you hear us? I can. So great. It's so Thank great you. to it's so great to learn from you again, Nancy. I really appreciate it. I, I have a question of theory, and it's probably more a point of clarification than anything else. You know, you seem to be defining capitalist systems in a little more straightforwardly economic way than some pl feminist political economists like me, uh, suggesting a step kind of toward a more multiple systems feminist understanding, uh, and yet also talk about the fractal tangles of these systems, yeah. which is a step closer to a unitary approach that suggests, for example, that while racism and sexism predate capitalism, they take forms within cap particular forms within capitalist societies and must be considered together. Yeah. And you know, this is a real old debate, but it sounds to me like maybe you're proposing, and I'm saying this a bit tongue in cheek, a third way. Um, are you? And and if you and if you are, how can you see this approach supporting progressive political action? Uh, well, I think that's a very astute observation. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to sidestep the single system, dual system debate by saying it's one system, but it has some very contradictory moving parts that are sometimes uh, in conflict and and sometimes uh, in concert. Um, I think one of the political implications is that uh, we need to look at uh, why, at the at the sources of people's opposition to uh, progressive policies. Um, and I don't think looking at them alone is going to solve the problem. But I think that um, I think there's been too much emphasis in in the political discourse in the US in particular on what I would call false consciousness. You know, uh, working class voters who, who are supporting Trump or ignorant or stupid, or they don't know where their real interests lie, or, uh, you know, they've been watching Fox News too much. There's a lot of, of very uh, uh, dismissive analysis of why less educated workers have um, have really become a major source of the Republican base. And I think in my view, part of that is that we, we, we focused so much on, on thinking about financial capital and asset ownership and not enough on human capital and on the tremendous differences in access to education and consequences of gaining access to education. Uh, and I, I think, you know, in a way, 
in a way, I see the Republicans as a party of financial capital and the Democrats as a party of human capital. You know, the, the, uh, the party for educated people on behalf of the educated without much concern for people that, are, uh, that, that lack that access um, to it. So um, I don't know, that's, that's as far as I've, that, that's as far as I've gotten in trying to answer that specific question. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not totally sure that it would, would, will work, uh, but I think that is my sort of strategic uh, argument is that if we focused more on the gains that uh, people could get from improved access to education um, and uh, better jobs, access to better jobs, I think we would do better. Thanks. Thank you. Um, before I move to the next question, let me just say we have about 15 more minutes. So if you have more pressing questions, feel free to share them in the Q&A box. The next question is from Luisa Nassif Pires. Luisa, are you there? Hey. Can, Hi. Hey. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabella. Congratulations, Nancy, and thank you so much for the talk. This was really great. I think my question actually goes very much in line with the last question. Uh, so I'm kind of going to read out what I wrote there already. You provide a much finer and complex understanding of intersecting systems of power, which convincingly shows that we need to move past the simplistic formula proposed that we need to all, we just need to join forces against a common enemy that is capitalism, and that the formula to do so is by calling onto a common interest that we all gain from that. Because you point out that there is conflict of interest in to, inside these complex systems. Uh, so mainly the way I read this that, is that you're pointing that we need to hope on solidarity a lot more, and that individual interests actually are more than just self-interests, that people are also interested in the good of other people. Uh, but I also have this feeling that our institutions and the same intricate system that you're talking about have actually been historically making us less and less solidaire uh, and has brought the individual to the front and little by little erased the community. So my question is how can we pass, well, first, if you agree that we are in such a conundrum and how would we pass this? You know, I like everything that you said, except the part about the common enemy is capitalism. I think that's too simple. The common enemy is a whole range of really unfair uh, institutional arrangements, some of which are not really cannot be blamed on capitalism. And I think when, when we use that shorthand, uh, capitalism is the common enemy, I think we lose the potential to rally people around a larger vision of a fair, just economic society. Um, in particular, I think people, I, I just think this, that challenging capitalism has become a kind of just shorthand for just challenging everything that we hate. And it's just not, um, it's just not very convincing. Uh, there are a lot of things to hate, or there, there are a lot of problems uh, uh, that we're facing that really can't be re reduced to capitalism. And it's not really clear sometimes what we can, what we're gonna do, you know, what we can do about them, where we can go about them. Uh, but, um, I think we need to articulate alternatives, you know, we need to tell people here, not just this is what we don't like, or this is what our common enemy is, we have to say, we have to say, this is what we could do together. This is how we could make things better. Um, and on the left, I think that has often been kind of dismissed as a sort of social democratic or wishy washy or, or, you know, wimpy uh, strategy, not instead of pushing for systemic change. But I, in my view, it's actually a necessary first step um, to moving towards a more uh, socialist economic system is to is to is to show people what they have to gain 
from uh, cooperation around uh, an institutional environment that, that they have some potential to democratically change. Um, so I don't know, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm in the process of, of sort of formulating this argument and your question just got me started and in that direction. So thanks. We could talk further, I hope, about it. Yes, I really hope so too, yes. Yeah. It's yeah. just the start of something, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Jenny La next. Jenny, are you there? I am, but I think actually um, we heard the answer. So I would suggest going to another question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then we would like to move to Amitava Dutt. Amitava Dutt, are you there? Professor Dutt, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, hi Nancy. This is Amitava. Hi. Uh, I really, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, and it's uh, an effort to complicate things beyond simplistic notions of, uh, you know, class struggle or, uh, or means of production. But I had two questions for you. Um, one which, which um, um, asks, uh, wonders if you, if you have gone far enough, and another which seems to say you maybe you you're going too far. Too far yeah. Okay. Now about the first question, it's good to focus on all the things you focused on, like the development of capabilities, uh, uh, inequality, uh, power, and all these issues. But I did not hear you say anything about who we are. Okay. That is, and I'm not talking about individualism, but as much as you know, even if you have multiple identities, who are we? Uh, and what I what I mean by this is uh, a power struggle within ourselves that is both uh, related to, um, uh, caused by, and causes uh, another set of whole problems. And I think by asking questions like not asking questions like this we are maybe ceding too much ground to the right who thinks this is moral values and family values and re religion and some, some kind of spiritualism. Um, so that's, that's one, one point. And I refer, of course, to the idea of Gandhi here about uh, freedom, and not only from oppression, but from one's own uh, inner conflict. Uh, about going too far, uh, is, uh, is, is I say this in jest uh, to some extent, that uh, there's a distinction between the real world and an analytical or theoretical framework, right? Or, or, or even call it an epistemological framework. The, the, the beauty of Marxian thinking is that it's, it's, an, it's a very clear starting point uh, from production, uh, social relations, class into which many people have, have properly, including you, have kind of shown some sympathy in, in, in bringing in other issues like race, gender, and so forth. So, um, you know, whatever the starting point is, we can take it further. So are you sort of maybe complicating it, compli complicating it too much by, by uh, giving up uh, specific starting points? Sorry. Um, yes, I, uh, I, I understand that the, this is the response that I get from many people uh, working in the Marxian tradition is that, uh, that I'm diluting uh, a, a, very, a very strong, simple, compelling, unified uh, theory of, of exploitation. Um, but I guess I don't view it as dil dilution. I view it as uh, rend rendering that theory more supple, um, more nimble, more more flexible, more improvisational, 
um, in its attention to collective identity and conflict. And I, I, I take your point that the complexity on the, um, uh, you know, once you sort of look at the at, at, at the fragmentation of social groups and the shifting identities uh, that people have, you have to recognize that those are also internalized, you know, that in a way we are a society of selves, not just one unified self. And, and that's sort of exactly my, my point in a way that, that if we did a better job of recognizing the multiplicity of selves that people inhabit, I think we could arrive at a better understanding of how they uh, might be willing to join forces and cooperate in ways that could yield some very uh, tangible benefits to themselves and their their families and their and their communities. I I'm very much motivated by the fact that I grew up in a very conservative family in a very conservative part of the country and very much surrounded by um, people, family, friends, and community of, of very different um, political interpretation of the world than my own. And um, so I just feel a really strong calling to try to figure out a way to overcome uh, those divisions, which have become, as you know, especially painful in the US over the last four years. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Rebecca Gomez next. Yes. Rebecca, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nancy and, and Isabella for this. My question is really, I think nothing to, to do until now, until the question that you ask now, is what is the place of the environment um, environmental questions and uh, nature and for example the ecofeminism in your proposal of decline of patriarchal system yeah thanks i guess i see the main link uh, between uh, care politics and environmental politics uh, is focusing on, on their public good aspects. Uh, the fact that we live in a world where our individual actions have unanticipated consequences for other people means that we need to cooperate more effectively. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the lessons of the pandemic. Um, th there's no real individual escape. Uh, if, we wanna, if we wanna end the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to move towards global vaccination of virtually everyone to really bring it under control. It can't be done individually. The climate crisis is another example of uh, something that really requires international collaboration cannot be accomplished through the market or even through national policies alone. And I think the care crisis like that is something that it, it can't be addressed on an individual level. It really requires coming to agreement with one another about how we're gonna care for future generations and current generations. And thinking about it more explicitly, problematizing it, pointing out that uh, in the past, it's been organized in ways that have been very inefficient and very unfair to women, and that there's potential to reorganize it in a better way. Um, so, you know, the old cliche is that crisis brings opportunity. And I, I hope I'm really, I just sincerely hope that the care crisis is an opportunity to think more, um, more effectively about climate change and vice versa. Thank Thanks for you. asking that question. Yeah. Next, we have a question from Randall Wilson. Randall, are you there? Can you talk to us? Yes, um, great talk. Uh, I'm interested in how you see this discourse coming out of the pandemic about essential work, uh, what implications it has for 
for the bargaining power of care work, particularly, I mean, paid care work, but also um, unpaid care work. Yeah, great question. I, I think, you know, the, the very concept of essential worker is fascinating because it, it, it's a definition based on social need rather than on market logic. Um, and I think, um, I think it's kind of highlighted the limitations of market logic. And I hope it's contributed to, or I think it could contribute to uh, a greater sense of solidarity with um, workers in the care sector and low wage workers in general, uh, based on the recognition that uh, we are likely in the future to be facing crises that require people um, uh, to make decisions and allocate their time and energy in ways that are not completely dictated by the market. Um, and, and I think there is a kind of subliminal appreciation of that that helps explain why, um, as we were discussing earlier, the Democratic Party is moving in a, in a more proactive direction. That said, however, uh, it's also true that essential workers in, in most countries don't have very much bargaining power. Um, and I think that that uh, the very low levels of personal protective equipment and, and, and hazard pay in most countries really testify to that uh, lack of, of, of bargaining power. Uh, so I think it's not it's not exactly clear what the right, you know, what the most effective strategy uh, for um, improving labor market outcomes, uh, in that area is going to be, other than I think pushing for greater solidarity, as in a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Great, thank you. We have one last question from Serena. Serena, can you hear us? Serena, would you like to unmute yourself? Um, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. So I'll um, ask the question on your behalf. Do you think that the situation of COVID-19 can help reevaluate the professions of care and thus reduce gender inequalities as women are more or oriented towards this path? I think it could do that. Whether it will or not, I don't know. But I think one, one really interesting feature, I think, of the... Um, terrible impact on care workers has been that a lot of high wage, relatively highly educated high wage care workers have been very negatively affected. Doctors, nurses have been hammered. Teachers have been hammered. I think that's going to increase their willingness to form coalitions with low wage care workers um, to move beyond a kind of narrow professional bargaining strategy to um, really think about um, how public policies could improve the performance of the care sector as a whole. At least I think that's an opportunity, an opening that we should try to take advantage of. Can't guarantee it will work, but. Thank you so much, Serena, for this question, that since this landed us on a hopeful note. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah. you even more to Nancy um, for this fascinating talk and for your careful way of answering all the questions that we have brought to your attention. I apologize to all those who, whose questions we didn't have a chance um, to ask, uh, but I think this has been a well-rounded and really enlightening discussion. Let me just advertise Nancy's book again. Um, if you like the talk and uh, you were enlightened by <laughs> Nancy's contributions, I'm sure you would also like her book. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for taking out the time to join us today. Let me also thank again Shovik and Lila in the background for um, making this happening, as well as um, Perry for Political Economy Research Institute at UMass um, for its support of this event today. Thank you so much, Nancy, for giving us the honor of launching your book um, with us here at the Political Economy Workshop at UMass. Our next session will be on the 16th of March, and we will jump to a completely different topic with uh, Professor Barry Norton. Um, we will learn about 
the question of is China today creating a new type of economic system? But that's just looking ahead. Um, thank you so much, Nancy, for um, presenting your book to us today. Thanks to everybody. It was I really I really enjoyed this uh, event. It was great.